President Calvin Coolidge, in his first annual address to Congress, delivered a speech in late 1923. Under our Constitution, their rights are just as sacred as those of any other citizen. It is both a public and a private duty to protect those rights. Congress ought to exercise all its powers of prevention and punishment against the hideous crime of lynching. We read this line from Coolidge because today, citizens' rights are on everyone's mind. In 2021, Americans are looking back and rating our presidents on this issue. In this episode, we're going to provide you the record on our own President Coolidge. Then you can decide what you think about where he fits in and what you think about judging presidents from other eras generally. That's coming up on The Coolidge Way. I'm Jim Douglas, four-term governor of Vermont and big fan of our 30th president, Calvin Coolidge. Coolidge was a thoughtful man. Using his perspective on governmental do's and don'ts, we'll evaluate today's important challenges, and we'll always ask, what would Coolidge do? This is The Coolidge Way, proudly presented by the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation. The first quarter of the 20th century was a time of ferment, with the same sense of urgency that we feel today. People want changes now. America had been a democracy for a century and a half, yet some Native Americans didn't and couldn't vote. Many African Americans were blocked from voting in the South. Until 1920, women didn't have the franchise. They couldn't vote in presidential elections. That meant that in our democracy, more than half of our voting age population weren't included in elections. As president, even before, Coolidge built a record of working to get more Americans their rights. Let's start with one group that doesn't get enough attention, Native Americans. In the early 1920s, some American Indians weren't even citizens. There was a push to allocate space as sovereign territory for tribes, what we later came to know as reservations. Here, President Coolidge did something special. He signed a law that recognized all Native Americans as citizens of the United States, Coolidge wasn't a fan of sovereign nations. Citizenship was the emphasis he chose, so he ensured that Native Americans were American citizens. Just around the time Warren Harding and Calvin Coolidge came to Washington, the American people, through the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, gave women the right to vote in federal elections. President Wilson wasn't wild about suffrage for women, but Presidents Harding and Coolidge were supportive. In fact, it was their Republican Party that took the lead on women's suffrage. The political consultants of the day were said to have been enthusiastic about Warren Harding as the GOP candidate in 1920, in part because they thought the suave Harding would appeal to newly enfranchised females. Well, tastes can shift. In any case, Coolidge, too, took part in the women's suffrage movement. As president, he appointed the first female federal judge, Genevieve Rose Klein. Judge Klein served on the United States Customs Court, what we now know as the Court of International Trade, for 25 years. Coolidge understood professional women, perhaps better than his predecessors. We know that because he married one. Grace Coolidge not only attended college, the University of Vermont, but also graduated from a program that trained teachers to work with the deaf. Grace's graduate school was the Clark School for the Deaf in Northampton, Massachusetts. In fact, that was where Grace Goodhue met young Calvin. The Coolidges ran a traditional home. Day to day, Mrs. Coolidge raised their sons. Still, even while Coolidge was in the White House, the president paid tribute to Grace's work. The Coolidges hosted America's most inspiring challenged citizen, the blind and deaf woman who graduated from college and became a well-known author, Helen Keller. Many years later, as he left the presidency, Coolidge showed the world how proud he was of Grace's school and, of course, Grace's role in teaching the deaf. Coolidge did this with a remarkable gesture. He successfully encouraged his friends to raise $2 million for the Clark School, a testament to the family's commitment to the deaf and to his spouse's life's work. What about African Americans? Under President Wilson, the federal government resegregated important branches of government, most infamously the post office, which employed thousands. Harding and Coolidge took a different policy. 
They didn't support segregation, but they didn't always desegregate actively. What did Coolidge do? Well, while vice president and president of the U.S. Senate, Coolidge spoke out forcefully in support of legislation to end lynching, a heinous and racist crime. Southern senators blocked the bill. As president, Coolidge spoke out against lynching repeatedly in his annual messages, and Coolidge was quick to show disapproval of anyone in his own party who did not respect the right of African Americans to hold office in the United States. In 1924, the year Coolidge was running for election, a fellow Republican wrote the president to suggest that an African American should not run for Congress. Coolidge wrote back that he was amazed someone would even dare to write such a letter. Coolidge reminded his interlocutor that over a half a million black Americans served during the Great War and that the Constitution grants them the same rights as every other citizen. The African-American newspaper, the Chicago Defender, praised Coolidge for his staunch defense. Coolidge tells Kluxers when to stop, read the headline. Coolidge addressed the importance of equality for all Americans in every State of the Union message. Speaking to Congress in 1925, he noted that African Americans accounted for nearly a tenth of the nation's population. Here is Coolidge interpreter Tracy Messer quoting from that speech. The progress which they have made in all the arts of civilization in the last 60 years is almost beyond belief. Our country has no more loyal citizens, but they do still need sympathy, kindness, and helpfulness. They need reassurance that the requirements of the government and society to deal out to them even-handed justice will be met. They should be protected from all violence and supported in the peaceable enjoyment of the fruits of their labor. Those who do violence to them should be punished for their crimes. No other course of action is worthy of the American people. The following year, Coolidge reiterated his commitment to include everyone in American life. The social well-being of our country requires a constant effort for the amelioration of race prejudice and the extension to all elements of equal opportunity and equal protection under the laws which are guaranteed by the Constitution. Coolidge pointed out that the Constitution guaranteed the rights of African Americans specifically and called on all Americans to live up to their ideals, saying, Our claim that we are an enlightened people requires us to use all our power to protect them from the crime of lynching. Although violence of this kind has very much decreased, while any of it remains, we cannot justify neglecting to make every effort to eradicate it by law. Before we bring in our guests for this episode, we need to take a quick break. Our Calvin Coolidge pop quiz asks this question. Coolidge was lieutenant governor, serving in Massachusetts in the teens. We know that women won the right to vote in 1920, so who was the first female to serve as lieutenant governor in the United States? Think that over, and we'll have the answer at the end of this episode. I also want to take a moment to let you know how you can get in touch with us. Send us your thoughts on this episode at CoolidgeFoundation.org slash The Coolidge Way or by visiting our social pages on Facebook or Twitter. We'd love to see your comments and any ideas you have for future episode topics. To expand further on this, I've asked Coolidge Foundation trustee Kurt Schmoke to join us. Kurt is the president of the University of Baltimore, but many listeners may know him as Mayor Schmoke because he served as the mayor of Baltimore for a dozen years from 1987 to 1999. He's also served as dean of the law school at Howard University. And interestingly, Kurt Schmoke was one of the leaders of the black students at Yale University during a period of protest back in the 1970s. It was Kurt who helped quell the unrest around the time of the Black Panther trials in New Haven, Connecticut, and we're really delighted to have him join us today. Welcome, Kurt. 
Thank you, Governor. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, we understand that uh, Calvin Coolidge first came to your attention when you were dean of the law school at Howard University. What did you discover then? Yeah, it was quite a surprise for me. I, I guess I didn't know a great deal about the tenure in office of uh, President uh, Coolidge. Uh, but as I, I mentioned to a couple of people before, I was walking through one of the administration buildings at uh, Howard University, which, as you know, is a historically black college and university, and um, happened to see this picture of the 1924 graduation uh, ceremony. And there was uh, Calvin Coolidge as the speaker. And, of course, I was uh, struck by that because uh, I remember uh, hearing about uh, Lyndon Johnson speaking at uh, at Howard in the 1960s, uh, but I uh, was not aware of any other president, particularly a Republican president, uh, speaking at uh, Howard University. And uh, certainly back in the 1920s, uh, that would uh, certainly not be expected. But I read uh, after seeing the picture, uh, I went back and got a copy of the speech. And I was just pleasantly surprised at, at the tone uh, and the uh, it's really quite an inspiring uh, speech uh, uh, not for the 1920s, but it, it stands the test of time, even for today. Kurt, you've written a number of articles about this. How would you characterize President Coolidge's record on civil rights? Well, uh, Governor, actually, in, in one of my articles, I refer to uh, President Coolidge as an unsung hero of civil rights. And I really believe that uh, when he gave a speech at Howard University back in the 1920s, it was actually 1924 commencement, it was truly an inspiring speech that uh, I, I believe stands the test of time. He wrote about the fact that there was the, the country uh, should be committed to equality of opportunity for all, that people shouldn't be judged on the color of their skin. He even announced that uh, he was uh, supporting uh, appropriations to uh, Howard University uh, for uh, medical education, that is to create more African-American uh, doctors. And he chastised those who criticize uh, African-Americans, uh, uh, saying that they were uh, essentially second-class citizens uh, because he recognized the very strong support African-American men and boys gave to the World War I effort on uh, uh, the fact that they were treated uh, harshly coming back to the United States and uh, President Coolidge was against that. So all in all, when you read it, uh, the speech, actually, uh, from my point of view, you can compare the uh, President Coolidge's 1924 speech to Lyndon Johnson's 1964 speech, and you would say that there was continuity there in terms of president demonstrating leadership uh, in, uh, in civil rights and uh, promoting equality of opportunity for all. In that same year, 1924, uh, Coolidge was approached by a white Republican, and uh, that person wanted uh, the president to uh, block support for a candidate for Congress who, who happened to be black. How did Coolidge react to that overture? Yeah, it was uh, quite interesting. I, I read about uh, that, that incident, and I said that, uh, uh, first of all, uh, it was great that um, the, the president uh, push back on the notion uh, that uh, the critic uh, said uh, the critic said that you shouldn't uh, 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 support having an African American in Congress because this is quote a white nation unquote. And the president uh, Coolidge pushed back uh, on that, but he did it in a way that I think is consistent with this uh, description of him as silent uh, cow. Uh, he wrote the the gentleman. Uh, a letter um, explaining that he was going to support the uh, uh, African-American uh, Republican uh, nominee for this congressional seat, uh, push back on the notion that this uh, uh, is a white uh, nation. But he didn't make a, a lot of publicity uh, about it. Uh, he allowed the letter to be published, um, but 
uh, and and then the the black press in particular picked up uh, on it and made uh, uh, distributed it quite broadly. But uh, the president himself didn't kind of you know go out and beat his chest and uh, talk about you know what a great guy he was for pushing back on this. But he was clear, he was definitive, uh, and it made uh, quite an impression among uh, black uh, intelligentsia and the black community uh, generally. And uh, he got pretty good support uh, at the time, uh, you know, in in the election uh, from the black community. And uh, you recall, of course, that uh, at that time, uh, the majority of blacks who were voters in the United States voted Republican because that was the party of Lincoln. And uh, uh, Coolidge definitely uh, lived up to the uh, idea that this indeed was the party of Lincoln. We're chatting with Kurt Schmoke, a trustee of the Coolidge Foundation, former mayor of Baltimore, now the president of the University of Baltimore. Kurt, um, you implied uh, correctly, of course, that we had some real challenges in race relations in our country a century ago. But during the 1920s, the Ku Klux Klan seemed to implode and the incidents of lynching um, went down during that decade. Any thoughts on why that that's the case? Well, I I believe that this is another example about uh, leadership at the top making a difference. Um, Calvin Coolidge uh, came uh, into the presidency, of course, you know, after the uh, untimely death of, of Harding, but following the eight years that Woodrow Wilson had been president, and during uh, that time, the Klan, Ku Klux Klan was on the rise. Lynchings uh, uh, had occurred. And uh, President Wilson, uh, um, you know, much to our everyone's disappointment, uh, failed to uh, support anti-lynching uh, laws. He um, actually uh, removed a lot of African-Americans from uh, federal service. Um, he uh, had a... Um, he showed the uh, movie uh, The Klansman, or what was uh, later titled Birth of a Nation. Um, he showed that in uh, the White House. So all the signals from the uh, the top of government, top leadership, uh, uh, were that uh, some of the worst atrocities uh, committed uh, in the name of uh, uh, supporting this as a white nation were either going to be tolerated or supported. And then Coolidge, uh, uh, as president, comes in and makes it very clear that it will not be tolerated, that he would support uh, the uh, uh, anti-lynching legislation, and that uh, he stood very firmly uh, for equality of opportunity uh, for all. Uh, So the the signal uh, from uh, the White House uh, was very, very strong, uh, uh, quite important, and I think helped to uh, set the standards uh, that uh, led to a decrease in the, the terrible uh, crime of, of lynching uh, in the United States. Well, Kurt, um, we certainly appreciate your commitment to the Coolidge Foundation, to the legacy of our 30th president. Tell us about your um, your dedication to, to his uh, uh, service and, and the history of Calvin Coolidge, and in particular, what... Uh, what Coolidge can do for the nation's young people today? Well, I uh, think particularly because we're in another one of those periods of hyper-partisanship that we can look at the uh, career of uh, President Coolidge and, and recognize that we can agree to disagree on things without being disagreeable and that, uh, in fact, uh, we are uh, one nation and uh, that we should be uh, committed uh, to uh, highlighting uh, uh, diversity of opinion uh, and that when we work together, we can achieve uh, really uh, great things. Uh, I'm particularly pleased to be involved in the uh, uh, Coolidge Scholarship uh, Program that is uh, helping to identify and nurture a new generation of leaders uh, for uh, the United States. And I do believe that uh, what we can uh, learn is that there are are ways of solving problems, um, even in very tough times, even in bitter 
uh, times and um, uh, that Coolidge should be a, a true beacon of light uh, for all of us as we move into the next decade. Well, let's all hope that we can come together, as uh, as you suggest. What a great discussion about Calvin Coolidge, civil rights, and uh, the era of our nation a century ago. I want to thank Kurt Schmoke so much for joining us on this episode. Thank you, Kurt. And thank you very much, Governor. What can we conclude? We know that Coolidge wasn't perfect on civil rights. His habitual gradualism may have seemed too gradual for some, but this was a fault shared by many politicians of his era. Some African Americans must have thought so, for they shifted to the Democratic Party in the 1930s. Black Americans often had pictures of Abe Lincoln in their homes. It was said that they turned that picture to the wall when they forsook the party of abolition. But as Mayor Schmoke says, What we've seen is that it's important to judge presidents by the standards of their time. And we can say that Coolidge was a unifying leader who improved the lives of Americans, including women, Native Americans, and African Americans, during his presidency. By the late 1920s, as his time in the White House came to an end, the number of lynchings dropped, and the Ku Klux Klan lost thousands of members. So we at the Coolidge Foundation think there's much to appreciate in Coolidge's record on civil rights. It's worth closing with a few little-known stories. One involves Coolidge's place of worship in the nation's capital, First Church. At the time, Washington was largely segregated, but First Church had a long tradition of integration. When we think of presidents and race, we often think of how the contralto Marian Anderson sang at the Lincoln Memorial in 1939 during the Roosevelt administration, a great event in the history of America. But in fact, the Coolidge's church, First Church, hosted a performance by Marian Anderson in the 1920s. In addition, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, which opened just a few years ago on the National Mall, dates back to Coolidge. On his final day in office, March 4, 1929, Coolidge signed Public Resolution 107 that authorized the creation of what would become the museum. You can learn more about this on the Smithsonian Institution's website. The Coolidge Way is a production of the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation with offices in Plymouth Notch, Vermont, and Washington, D.C. A special thanks to Coolidge interpreter Tracy Messer for helping us with some important quotes from President Coolidge's speeches. If you have any thoughts, questions, or comments on this episode or any other, please don't hesitate to send me a note at coolidgefoundation.org slash the Coolidge Way or on one of our social pages. Earlier in this episode, our Calvin Coolidge pop quiz asked you this question. Who was the first woman to serve as a lieutenant governor in the United States? The answer, Consuelo Northrop Bailey of Vermont from 1955 to 1957. She was also a county prosecutor during Prohibition from 1927 to 1931. And Lieutenant Governor Bailey was born in Fairfield, the same town as President Chester Arthur. I'm former Vermont Governor Jim Douglas. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us for another episode of The Coolidge Way.